All right, consider this question. If you take an atom from the center of your material, right, you've got some bulk of material. If you take one away from the center of that material, you move it to the surface, should there be a difference in energy? Or in other words, should there be an energy penalty for that action? Taking it from somewhere in the middle, somehow pulling it out of the middle and sticking it on the surface. It's still part of the material. You've just moved where it is in that material, bulk to surface. So there is an energy penalty. Now, why is it an energy penalty? Let's think about it in terms of entropy and enthalpy. We'll do enthalpy first, so bonding, right? So imagine if it's a simple, like a cubic arrangement, right? So you've got atoms at the intersections of all these points, right? Plus coming in and out of the page as I've drawn it here. So if you take this atom right there, how many atoms is it bonded to if it's in the bulk of the material? Well, it's clearly bonded to one, two, three, four atoms around it that way plus behind it and in front of it. So let's say that it has six bond, that it's six coordinated, right? So it has six bonds. So if you pull that out of the center, you had to break those six bonds. Now when you move it and put it on the surface, how many bonds will you form? That depends on what the surface looks like and where it goes on the surface. For example, is it going to go right here on a totally empty flat plane? Then it's only going to make one bond below it, right? What if you put it, if there's an empty spot on that surface and it fills that empty spot? Well, then it's going to have five bonds, right? The four around it, one below, but nothing above, right? So that's making more bonds than just one. What if you put it right here along an edge, right? What, in that corner spot. In that corner spot, it's going to bond to one, two, three different atoms, right? Um, so we call that a kink edge, right? So there's all these different ed names for different things, right? And depending on where it sits on the surface, you're going to form more or less bonds. But in general, <clears throat> when you pull it out of the center, it had six bonds, and you put it on the surface, let's say it has only three, that means that you have an enthalpy penalty, right? You have to pay a penalty in terms of bonding changes, right? So if it's not enthalpy that's driving this to happen, then it must be entropy. So why is entropy driving this? Well, think about it. Even though it did cost enthalpy, when you put a vacancy in that structure somewhere in the middle, that increases the randomness, right? The randomness of your crystal has increased because instead of it all being easy to describe, there's an atom on every position, now you've got a vacancy, and that vacancy can maybe move around, and that is a degree of disorder, which you didn't have before, right? So this leads us to modifying our expression for the free energy of this system, right? The, the change in the Gibbs free energy is now going to be equal to the concentration of your vacancies multiplied by whatever the change in Gibbs free energy for forming a vacancy is. And then we're going to add to that another term, this whole big term over here, which is called the entropy of mixing, right? Entropy of mixing. So what's going on in this expression? You've got NV, we know that's the number of vacancies, right? You've got NA, your number of atoms total, right? Right, so you have these two expressions, and when you take those together, that gives you your entropy of mixing, right? So uh, <clears throat> that actually, I'm going to spare you the algebra, is, but is how we get to this expression for NV equals N times exponential of negative QV over KVT, right? So that is the expression for how many vacancies we have and why it's a thermally activated process, right? Now, remember... Some compounds also allow you to have non-stoichiometric compositions, right? Non-stoichiometric defects can also be permitted. Uh, a great example of this is iron oxide. So in all these cases, you have to have charge neutrality maintained. So however much positive charge, you have to have just as much negative charge, or it won't be charge neutral, right? Um, however, if you've got cations that can take multiple oxidation states, we've seen this in previous uh, homework problems, that you can end up with non-stoichiometric compounds. A good example is iron oxide, Wustite, named after Fritz Wust, founder of the Max Planck Institute in Germany, right? Uh, for iron research anyways. Uh, now in that compound, iron can be both iron two plus and it can be iron three plus, right? So what sort of defect should this allow? Well, think about it. Normally, you would expect iron oxide to be FeO, okay? But in that case, this must be all 2 plus, and this must be 2 minus. Well, we know oxygen is going to be 2 minus. But what if, if the iron can be both 1 plus and 2 plus? What is that going to create? Well, it's going to lead us to this scenario where you can actually end up with Fe 1 minus Xo, right? You can end up with 
less iron because you can have both 1 plus and 2 plus. So this leads us to have vacancies on the iron site, right? So in this structure where all the irons are, you're going to end up with some vacancies because some of your iron can be 1 plus charged instead of 2 plus charged, right? Because of that, uh, we say that this is no longer stoichiometric. It becomes non-stoichiometric, okay? Now here's an interesting question. How should vacancies correlate to thermal expansion? All right, let's take and draw this. We've seen thermal expansion before, right? So if we plot delta L over L, so this is the change in length over whatever its initial length was. Actually, let's just put percent change for a minute. All right, that's our percent change, and down here is going to be temperature, right? What do we know about this? Well, as you warm this material, you have the following. We know that delta L is going delta L over L is going to increase for most materials delta L over L, right? That is thermal expansion. Literally, if you have some material, right, the plastic in this box, when I heat it up, it's going to expand a little bit, right? And that's going to be delta L over L. Now, how much of that expansion comes from the lattice parameter, right? Or in other words, if we plotted the lattice parameter change, it would look something like this. This is delta A over A. So the overall component is going to increase, let's assume, that it's a material that expands under uh, heating. Then part of that expansion is from the lattice parameter literally getting bigger, that the unit cell increases when you heat it up, but not all of it. Some of it is due to vacancy formation, right? Again, let's assume we had this big crystal, but we pull an atom out of the center, and we put it on the surface, creating a vacancy in the center, that technically made the crystal a little bit bigger right here on the surface. So if you get enough of those, believe it or not, you can actually get a non-zero contribution to the overall uh, expansion of your device. It can be atoms coming out of the center and moving to the surface because of entropy, right? So this difference between these two, the difference between those two lines at any given point, well, that is equal to NV over N divided by 3, right? So your vacancy concentration divided by your total number of sites divided by 3 can account for that difference between those two lines, right? The math behind that kind of goes as follows. At low temperatures, we know that it's a thermally activated process, right? We know that NV divided by N is equal to the exponential of the activation energy, negative activation energy for vacancy formation, over whatever your thermal energy is, KBT. So at low temperatures, NV over N is going to be a really small number, right? And sure enough, it approaches zero, right? It vanishes down here at low temperatures. But at high temperatures, um, with vacancies, you've got your total number of atoms, like the, the size of your component is going to be the total number of atoms plus the number of vacancies you formed, because every one of those vacancies put an atom on the surface, so it got larger. So uh, that allows us to write this expression that delta L over L cubed simply equal to Na plus Nv multiplied by the quantity of A over delta A cubed. Or finally, the more useful form of this equation is as follows. Um, chi V, which is our vacancy concentration, it's Nv over the total number of atoms, right, is equal to 3 times the quantity of delta L over L minus delta A over A.